so thank you very much, Kroisa, um, and welcome to uh, to this is the the next um, instalment of the Living Seas Sean Anigan Miri Moral um, Festival. Um, so we've got a really interesting talk tonight, hopefully. Well, I'm sure we do. Uh, I've actually I've had the pleasure of um, of being on one of John's courses down at um, Dale uh, Dale Fort um, FSC Centre down in Pembrokeshire, um, and it was it was a fascinating weekend. It was it was really interesting, and we were just talking, and I was saying that the weather was absolutely stunning. So that was um, I think that that was a bonus for the weekend, but it was really interesting. So John um, John Arch Thompson was actually the deputy head of Dale Fort Centre and um, and then uh, subsequently wrote a book, um, Rocky Shaw's book, which is really, it's a beautiful book and it's a really interesting read if any of you get a chance. And if you wanted uh, a chance of winning one of the um, that book, then join in, in the quiz tomorrow night uh, at 7.30. Um, so, and you don't have to be a marine expert because it will be, it will be a raffle. Um, so if you wanted to, to um, win that book, but uh, without further ado, I think I'm going to hand over to you, John, if that's OK. And um, we'll keep admitting people to the waiting room. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Lovely. OK, well, I'll get going. Um, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, stroke evening. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that having written a book on this, I could talk for approximately a fortnight uh, and I've got slightly less time than that. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully start this PowerPoint, which should all go swimmingly. Right, hopefully, can you see my first slide? Yeah, we've got that, John. That's perfect. Got that. Lovely. Yeah, right. lovely. I'll rattle on and um, just just uh, butt in if there's anything you need to say or it all goes horribly wrong or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> I'll let you know. Don't worry. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as I say, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a chat about Rocky Shores, uh, concentrating really on sheltered Rocky Shores. And in my very biased opinion, they're one of the most interesting habitats on the planet. And I think one of the reasons they're so interesting is that they're so extreme and people take this for granted I suspect since everybody in Britain is 70 miles away from a rocky shore what's that 110 kilometers um, they just don't think that they're that special whereas in fact they're incredible and here's a shot from the place where I used to be assistant head of center this is Dale Fort Jetty at high tide and this is Dale Fort Jetty at low tide and you can see there's quite a difference and in fact Pembrokeshire has got a, a 7.8 meter difference between the highest high tides and the lowest low tides and I actually looked it up I did a survey in um, the Menai Straits not too long ago and their tidal range is somewhat similar but of course it's rather bizarre because you've got tides coming in from both ends of the straits, which complicates matters a lot. Um, but here's a, a picture of a shore, uh, or the tides running up and down a shore, and you can see the graph axis on the left goes up to eight meters. So in Pembrokeshire, the highest tide you might expect to get in the whole year is actually 7.8 meters. And if we assume that the lowest tide you'd ever get is zero meters, and then the axis along the bottom is, is days. And what you can see is sometimes the tide moves up and down a little bit on the left of the graph, and sometimes the tide moves up and down quite a lot. That's the right hand side of the graph. And um, if you looked at the tides for a whole year, you would find out that there was a highest tide in the whole year. And in fact, that one is, I don't think you can see my mouse, but, um, it's that peak one in from the right hand side of the diagram that's the highest high tide of the year and then the lowest low tide of the year goes right the way down the bottom and because that's the highest high tide of the year everything above it just gets splashed and sprayed it doesn't actually get um, covered in seawater and then you have something called the upper shore which you can see doesn't really get that wet and when it does 
get wet, it doesn't get wet for long. And the middle shore is pretty much 50-50, half blue, half gray. And then the lower shore is predominantly wet in a nutshell. And it's that environmental gradient, it's that difference in conditions from the top to the bottom of the shore that makes rocky shores the incredibly interesting places that they are because there's so many different stresses and strains on organisms trying to live on the shore and they're very very different depending on where on the shore in terms of height um, that you live and notice that although we talk about the tide going in and out it's really an oscillation uh, the tide goes up and down and it appears to go in and out because of the shape of the land so what I'd like to do is start in the splash zone and work our way down the shore and see what happens. So, oh yeah, before I do that, there's a real rocky shore rather than a rather tedious diagram. And I think it's fair to say that even without knowing too much about it, there's more stuff at the bottom. So bear in mind that most of the things I'll chat about this evening are marine or they're derived from marine forms. So in other words, they like seawater and the higher up the shore you go, the less time you spend under seawater and therefore the more stressed you are likely to be. And in the days when I did this with A-level students regularly, I used to get them to plot a, a massive graph of their results. And if you ignore the yellow um, histograms, their lichens, they're a little bit different. I think it's fair to say you can see that there's more stuff in the lower shore to the left hand side of the graph than there is to the right. So this, this backs up this environmental gradient that I will be talking about quite a bit. So let's start in the splash zone. Splash zone is a kind of no man's land or indeed no woman's land um, where it's not marine enough for marine organisms to survive but it's a little bit too terrestrial, um, yeah, it's a bit too salty and salt sprayed for many terrestrial things to survive. And so in this in-between zone, if you like, lichens, which are incredibly tolerant of extreme environments, do rather well. And I suspect you're familiar with this idea that lichens, there's a, an extreme close-up of a, a Xanthoria lichen. Um, they're not one thing, but two, they're a fungus, which provides the structure of the, uh, the lichen. And then they have little algal cells embedded within them. Um, but actually it's got a lot more complicated than that in recent years. There's a chap called Spribill, it's a name that doesn't trip off the tongue. And what he's discovered is that you've got the Ascomycete fungus. That's the one with the little jam tart like reproductive structures you could see in the picture before. That's, that's the main structure. And then you've got algal cells and or cyanobacterial cells embedded within the main fungal structure. And the cozy idea is that the algae give the fungus the products of photosynthesis and the fungus give the algae a nice place to live. Um, there's holes with that, but it's not bad. But then recently, early 2000s, they discovered that there were bacteria involved that were actually embedded in the structure of the fungus and they had nitrogen fixation roles and antibiotic roles so they, they helped in the defense of the, the lichen against disease and very recently I think it was 2016 they discovered yet another yeast involved a basidiomycete um, fungus a yeast and that's also involved in the, um, the structural part of the lichen so what we thought of as um, a symbiotic relationship between two things it turns out is at least four things and in fact this guy keeps on working and researching and if you've read uh, Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life I think it's called which is absolutely brilliant book about fungi um, it looks set that the picture is going to get more complicated still so lichens not just two things they're four little communities if you like living on the rocks but they tend to do very well in the splash zone and um, you don't really tend to get seaweeds macroalgae is just a, a posh term for seaweeds and there's a very good reason for seaweeds remember this zone is never covered with seawater 
it's only splashed and sprayed by it. And the seaweeds need seawater. It is their water supply. If you've ever seen a rocky shore with the tide out, you'll know seaweeds don't have their own supportive structures. They just flop down on the rock. So the sea is their support. It floats them up towards the light. They're photosynthetic organisms. And gas exchange and nutrient exchange with the water can only take place when they're underwater. You might think when the tide's gone out, hurrah, plenty of light for photosynthesis, but in fact it stops almost immediately the seaweed gets dry. So they've got to have seawater to photosynthesize as well. And they've also got to have seawater to reproduce because they shed their gametes into the water and um, you know, they're fixed to the rocks. They can't sort of shuffle up and have a massive great party. Um, they have to rely on the water to do the mixing of the gametes for them. So that's why you, you can't have seaweeds in the splash zone because they really do need seawater. There are a few very hardy marine animals that just survive in the splash zone. Now this little thing, it, it's a perhaps picture <laughs> making you think it's the size of a small dog or something. Um, a big one would be a centimetre from the pointy bit to the base. These are called rough periwinkles. They're marine snails and pretty much all of the animals that I'll show you use gills to respire and gills work best underwater. So this animal spends 90% plus of its life out in the air. So how on earth does it do that? Well, it doesn't really use its gills much. They're, they're pretty rubbish, but what it has is an air filled space in the shell, within the shell, between the shell and the body of the animal. And oxygen diffuses from that air filled space into the snail's tissues. So if you like, its, its shell is acting as a lung. And, um, it's pretty good. In fact, it's more, it's better at respiring in the air than it is in the water. And if you put these little chaps in a, an aquarium, they, they promptly crawl out of the water and sit on the top of the tank because they can respire better in the air than in water. Another big deal, obviously, if you're going to live that high up the shore, is um, avoiding water loss. Shells are good, but um, not every shelled thing can live this high up, so there's got to be more to it than that. A lot of these little snails have um, trap doors, which they close over the opening. And the big problem with that is that if you close your trap door, you could fall off the rocks and embarrass yourself in front of your contemporaries. So what the rough periwinkle can do is stick itself to the rocks with mucus, which is exactly what this one in the picture has done. Then it can close its trap door without uh, embarrassing itself in front of its peers. And that trap door is pretty good. It keeps water in, but it does allow a little bit of gas exchange to, to carry on as well. Um, repro I'm sorry, re reproductive, excretory products. One doesn't like to talk about those too much, but most marine things excrete ammonia. Fish do, for example. And this is wonderful. It's easy to produce, but it's really quite toxic. Uh, but if you're a fish, it doesn't matter because you just dilute it with water. And so fish gulp in water at one end and whack out ammonia at the other, and they're very happy. But if you live on the shore, water conservation is a really, really big deal. So what this clever little snail can do is it can switch excretory products such that it can use uric acid when it needs to. Uh, think bird poo, white stuff on your freshly washed car which means it can get rid of waste uh, without getting rid of precious water. And if you can live up there, you might remember, I've just said there are a lot of lichens in the splash zone. So this snail has access to a huge food supply because it eats lichens. And there are a few, if any other animals up there, one to eat it, the exception of small birds. Um, but two to compete with it for resources. So if you can live in this extreme environment, it's sometimes worthwhile. Um, yeah, you might have seen these. A very primitive family of wood lice called sea slates as they scuttle about in the, the high shore and splash zone, tidying the place up really, eating detritus, dead organic matter and dead bits and pieces and keeping the place in good shape. Right, the excitement continues. We'll move down a zone to the upper shore now. As you might remember from that initial graph, the upper shore, it does actually get covered in seawater, but not very often. 
and not for long. But we do have the excitement of some seaweeds, but I'll delay that a little bit to mutter about the lichens in the upper shore. This picture shows two. There's a black one covering the rocks. Uh, that's one of the black tar lichens. And then there's the lovely orange one. That's some um, color placa thalincola. Notice that really defined edge it's got. And um, they're flattened onto the rocks. If you're going to live on the rocks in an area that does get covered by moving water, it's absolutely useless having sticky up bits like this green sea ivory. You would just get smashed to pieces. So the upper shore lichens are flattened onto the rock surface um, as an adaptation, if you like, to coping with water movement. We do have two seaweeds. These are two brown seaweeds. The brown seaweed just underneath the upper shore banner you can see it's quite a thin thing and then if you move down the picture you'll see there are wider looking seaweed so we've got channel rack at the top and then we've got twisted or spiral rack down the middle bottom of the picture so how on earth do they live up here well the old theory was that channel rack lives where it does um, because it's extremely good at avoiding water loss then they redid the experiments and they discovered this was complete gibberish. Um, all seaweeds lose seawater at approximately the same rate. And um, the rather comforting little theory is like the channel you can see at the end of the arrow. They thought, well, that channel must, um, must keep moisture in, surely. Um, but what they overlooked was the fact that a concave surface, all right, you get an advantage from that. But most of the seaweed has its convex surface upwards so any advantage you gain from a concave surface, you promptly lose by having a convex surface facing the sun. So it isn't Channel Rack's ability to avoid water loss that's the, the key to its survival. It's its ability to tolerate water loss. And this remarkable little seaweed can lose 96% of its water content and still survive. I think um, human beings are in intensive care if we lose about 10% of our moisture. So that's, that's truly remarkable. The other thing about it, if you cast your mind back to that initial graph, even from a dry state like the one in this picture, where you could literally snap it, it's so dry, it's black and brittle. When the tide does eventually cover it, it can't sort of think, oh yeah, here we go, here's some water, I better get ready to photosynthesize soon. It's actually up and running with full photosynthetic rate within 20 minutes of being immersed in seawater. So it gets going really fast because it won't have much time before the tide goes out again. And this is where life gets even more exciting. What they have discovered relatively recently is that this seaweed has a fungus inside it, Mycophyceus ascophyllii, and they think that this fungus might be one of the ways in which the seaweed is able to resist desiccation so well. Nobody's quite sure how yet, but do you see the excitement here? I've just told you about lichens, which are a fungus with an algae inside them. Well here we've got a reverse lichen. This is an alga with a fungus inside it. And in fact, somebody at a, a seaweed conference was talking about egg wrap, which I'll show you later, which has the same arrangement. And somebody piped up from the back of the room and they said, well, isn't that a lichen then? And the guy giving the lecture said, as far as I'm concerned, it is. And as you can imagine, at a phycology conference, that raised some hackles. <laughs> People didn't like their, their seaweed suddenly being called lichens. Um, but it's just fascinating. And they, the more they look, the more they discover many, many seaweeds have actually got um, fungi inside them. And it's not an infection. It's a definite symbiosis. It's amazing. So Channel Rack, highest seaweed on British shores, very good at tolerating water loss, uh, not avoiding it. And, uh, you know, you often talk about seaweeds getting dried out, getting baked in the sun and so on, but it is worth bearing in mind, especially with the weather we're going to enjoy in the next few days, that seaweeds can get covered in ice and snow so that they have to tolerate cold. And here's a piece of information that actually blew my head apart when I first came across it. So I hope it doesn't leave you into a dismembered estate. 
photosynthesis as we know it doesn't work in land plants and in seaweeds based on classical physics. Photosynthesis is a quantum physics phenomena because when the light hits a leaf or a frond, the excited particles, the, um, the photons, have to get to the reaction centers in the leaf or the frond fairly quickly um, before they lose their energy. And what they discovered was that they were getting there too quickly just by a photon somehow finding a route towards the nearest reaction center. It was happening far, far too quickly. So with quantum physics, um, particles don't really behave like particles. They behave more like um, probabilistic waves, if you like. And the idea is that these things are spreading out in superposition all over the seaweed frond, trying out all possible routes to the nearest reaction center and choosing the most direct one. <laughs> and if, if you find that difficult to believe and or understand, don't worry, uh, Richard Feynman, who was one of the most amazing quantum physicists said, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't. So anyway, moving hurriedly along. Um, another typical upper shore brown seaweed is spiraled or twisted rack, and that's that rather flatter one. It's not quite as good as channel rack at coping with water loss. It'll pull in at about 95% rather than 96, but it's still pretty amazing. So these two upper shore browns are really quite extraordinary in that respect. Red seaweeds as a group, um, they've been kicking around for something like 1.2 billion years on the planet's surface. Uh, one Achilles heel red seaweeds have is their uh, pigments are very susceptible to being destroyed by UV. Uh, so you wouldn't really expect to get a red seaweed in the upper shore, but here we have this little thing called creeping chainweed, Catanella chispitosa, and it does. It, it's um, typical of upper shores, but only on north facing rocks, so away from direct sunlight. And as you can see from that picture, it also tends to hide under the two brown seaweeds that are there. So it has very, very uh, specific habitat requirements, if you like, north facing rocks only away from direct sunlight and under brown seaweeds. Uh, cracks and crevices, it likes those too. Green seaweeds, on the other hand, um, they're a little bit wild and free. They're, they're like the rock stars of the rocky shore. They can live all over the place. And their, their big strategy is live hard, die young. I mean, they're reproducing within months and then they die. And there's two absolute typical ones. There's this sea lettuce in the picture here. And the rather more stringy one, uh, it's called gutweed. They're all members of the Ulva genus now, um, but um, they can and do live all over the shore, if you like. They, they don't have a, a typical zonation position. Upper shore animals, uh, they tend to be shelled. So barnacles, well, they have calcium carbonate plates, but you can almost call them a shell. Uh, you have limpets, you have mussels, and you have more of the rough periwinkles, which I've rather exaggerated their size in that picture. You can actually see a rough periwinkle for scale uh, in between the middle three limpets on the left-hand picture. So they're, they're really not that gigantic. So obviously upper shore water loss, big deal, uh, good idea to have a waterproof shell. But there is a soft-bodied organism that can live up there. Looks a little bit like a discarded American hard gum. And um, yeah, when it's out of water, it looks like that. And when it's underwater, invariably it looks like that. So what this anemone has done is it's retracted its tentacles inside its body, hence it reduces its surface area from which you would otherwise lose lots and lots of water. Um, and you might have noticed if I go back one, the um, surface of the anemone is covered in mucus, which some people think helps it avoid water loss. Even so in the upper shore, it does tend to be in cracks and crevices and obviously rock pools. It's called the beadless anemone, you might be able to pick out these little blue beads towards the left of the column there and the right of the column. Um, those are concentrations of stinging cells and um, 
these things actually are territorial. They can move across the, the rock pool surface or across the rocks using their muscular foot very, very slowly. Um, and they actually have fights. Uh, they headbutt each other using these uh, concentrations of stinging cells to inflict damage on their neighbor, should one come too close. Uh, but they're quite slow to react. So if one head butts one, then the other one takes a couple of days to think about it and then sort of go and then, then head butts the initial one. And then a couple of days later, the initial one will head butt it back. And after about a week or so, one of, one, one of them will have decided it is lost and shuffles away to a safe distance. Um, but, um, oh, one thing that may not be obvious is these are carnivores. You might think they just filter stuff from the water, but those tentacles have got stinging cells in them and they paralyze things like fish, prawns, anything it can get onto the tentacles and then rips them apart and digests them at the multi-purpose orifice in the middle of the animal. So there's an exception to the trend there, if you like. It's a soft-bodied organism without a protective shell that can live that high up the shore. Okay, moving down. Uh, to the middle shore, you might remember with the graph that the, um, the middle shore gets covered and uncovered every day, twice a day. So as you go down the shore, conditions get better for marine organisms. Uh, having said that, lichens, it's the opposite. There's only one lichen left really, it's this green tar lichen, Vercaria mucosa. And just occasionally it has the good manners to look green rather than black as well. So it is more tolerant of seawater than the other lichens. And in fact, people have found that it actually has a requirement for moisture, albeit salty moisture. When they um, transplanted this lichen upshore, uh, it promptly dehydrated and died. And interestingly, when they translated uh, black tar lichen downshore to the middle shore, black tar lichen was promptly eaten by all the limpets and periwinkles and stuff that live in the middle shore. So another adaptation for this green tar lichen which helps it survive in the middle shore is it's packed full of anti-grazing chemicals, uh, phenolics and turpenoids and things like that. And um, that's one of the ways it avoids grazing pressure from the, the many snails that inhabit the middle shore. Absolutely typical middle shore seaweed is this one, bladderwrack. It's the rack or seaweed with the bladders. What are the bladders for? I don't actually hear you cry because you're all muted, but I'm sure you're wondering. Um, they're flotation vessels. How effective they are is anybody's guess really because you've got channel rack and twisted rack above this with no bladders and they do perfectly well. And then as you'll see in a minute, you've got serrated rack below it without bladders and it does perfectly well, um, but they do seem to, to do the seaweed some good. And on sheltered shores, they have more bladders than exposed shores. Um, so this is all a good thing. Get rid of that. I don't know whether you could see that. My computer decided to have a scheduled virus scan. Um, and what all seaweeds do when the tide goes out is they collapse into a heap Remember I mentioned they don't have any supportive structures. And that actually helps them conserve water. A, a seaweed in a heap will only lose 20% of the water it would lose if you spread it out flat. So this collapsing into a heap is a really, really good thing. There is a red seaweed that lives in the middle shore. Um, but as you can see this time, it's not on a north facing rock. It's actually sticking up into the sunshine. It's a thing called pepper dulse. And it's because it tastes peppery. If you're happy about the quality of the seawater around the shore you happen to be on, you can give it a quick nibble and it really does taste peppery. It's sold in Scotland as a, as a spice. And um, what this one can do, if you see it in the summer, invariably it looks like that. So the sunlight has broken its pigments down, as I mentioned, there's a, a bit of a thing that happens with red seaweeds. And what you can see in that picture, you see the white bit where all the pigment's gone, that, that's in big trouble. But then just by the white bits, there's actually some green pigment. That's because the red pigment uh, is only responsible for capturing light and it needs chlorophyll A to pass the electrons down the electron transfer chain. So all seaweeds have got to have chlorophyll A and that's what you can see 
looking green in that picture. But what this seaweed can do is resynthesize new pigments to repair the damage, which is immensely cunning. Moving hurriedly on, uh, middle shore, better environment for marine organisms, and you get a much, much greater variety of, of snails. Uh, there's dog whelks top left, there's barnacles, there's top shells, there's periwinkles, there's limpets, and so on and so forth. So lots more shelled things because life is much better for marine organisms. But you also get more soft-bodied things as well. Uh, oh, just in case you're interested, one of the ways you tell periwinkles from top shells is the shape of their little trapdoor. Remember I mentioned the operculum that the rough periwinkle closes to keep water in. Well, there's an edible periwinkles version. Can you see the trapdoor there is approximately teardrop shaped, whereas in a top shell, the trapdoor is a perfect circle. And the other thing that top shells have is that rather beautiful nacreous layer, mother of pearl layer, just round the inside of the, the shell rim. So top, top shells and periwinkles are actually fairly straightforward to tell apart if you, if you look closely enough. Uh, soft bodied things you get in the middle shore, you get the anemones still, but you also get a variety of sponges. And um, that orange sponge, Hymeniacidon pelavis, is a, a really common one on the shore. And then the green one, breadcrumb sponge, is um, it does change colour. It, it can be quite pale or it can be quite dark green. And it again has little zoanthelli inside it, little algae inside it. Uh, it might even be a dinoflagellate, actually. Um, which helps it photosynthesize. So you will find it as a range of different colors, but more uh, soft bodied things coming into the middle shore. Next, we move to Beverly Hills. If you're a marine organism, the lower shore is the place to be. So yeah, it's, it's by far the, the best environment for, um, for marine organisms. And as you might expect, there are a few, if any, lichens down there because Lichens can only tolerate so much immersion in seawater. Um, so lower shore doesn't tend to be a great place for lichens. Absolutely typical lower shore brown seaweed is this serrated rack. Uh, it's a rack, it doesn't, doesn't have gas bladders. You might notice there's a tiny little bit of gas bladder, uh, sort of middle bottom right of shot with the bladders there. Whereas serrated rack has no bladders and it has these serrated edges. And nature's cunning, you know, these serrated edges have a, have a purpose in very, very sheltered shores. Serrated rack has far more serrations than on shores that are exposed to wave action. So what they think is that the serrations cause micro turbulence in the water, which helps oxygenate it, which makes it a better environment for seaweed photosynthesis. Now this seaweed, can only lose 40% of its water content before it dies. You might remember channel rat can lose 95%, 96%. And then if we go even further down, right down to the level now of low spring tides, you get the kelps. And this is a typical sheltered shore kelp called uh, sugar kelp. Huge great seaweed. It can be a couple of metres or more long. Huge surface area from which to lose water and it's very, very sensitive to water loss. It can only lose 20% of its water content before it dies. So if you're asking why do things live where they do on the shore? Well, for brown seaweeds, it's actually simple. It's tolerance of water loss, uh, nothing more, nothing less. The other thing you might have noticed as we've gone down the shore is that the seaweeds have got longer. And that is because the lower shore seaweeds are actually faster growing seaweeds and they have more time underwater to grow as well. So they literally outcompete their upper shore uh, compatriots and um, just outshape them. And I, I guess the upper shore seaweeds had an evolutionary choice at some point, go live somewhere difficult or go extinct. Uh, so they chose the former. Now this next picture is a very unusual one. This is um, Laminaria hyperborea. You don't normally see this on the shore and you could probably guess that because it isn't collapsing into a heap like most seaweeds. Um, this one is hung up like washing to dry. And again, this kelp can only tolerate 20% water loss before it's doomed. Um, this was a freak low tide accompanied by 
a high pressure system and an offshore wind and the the sea went out at least 50 centimeters lower than it should have done exposing all these normal sublittoral things things that live below the tide marks so it's an unusual picture <laughs> rather an old one um, but with the seaweed you'll notice some other things as well if you think about animals in the lower shore you get far more animals there than you do higher up the shore one because it's a better environment as i have suggested but two because there's more food because there's more algae and three, there's actually more places to live. If you look at this seaweed, you can see there's a, an encrusting white patch on the blade of the seaweed. And in the hold fast, the sort of root-like structure holding it to the rock, there are sponges, there are little snails. Somebody did a survey and in one very old piece of kelp hold fast, they found a hundred different species living. So, what the animals are doing, they're using the seaweed as structure. And it's a little bit like if you've got a car park the size of a tennis court, well, with the best will in the world, uh, you can only park so many cars on it. But if you have a multi-storey car park of the same basal area, you can obviously get a lot more cars in because there are now a lot more layers to fill. And that's exactly what's going on with the animals. They're using the layers as places to live and that's one of the reasons why tropical rainforest is so rich, for example, because it has many layers, great structural complexity. And there are lots of lower shore specialists. That little white lattice of cells is one of the many species of sea mats. The um, orange jelly-like stuff is uh, one of the many, many species of sea squirts. And um, you get things called hydroids, those little white uh, blippy type stems all over the seaweed there. Those are relatives of the anemone. Each one of those little triangular blips is a, a zooid in its own right that has its own feeding apparatus and stinging cells. So they're part of the same phylum because um, they have stinging cells, all the jellyfish and the anemones. And uh, sorry, it's a completely different phylum. Ignore me there. But um, jellyfish and uh, hydroids have. Um, I'll try again. And enemies and the hydroids all have stinging cells, which unites them in that, that particular phylum. Um, there is a snail that tends to specialise in the lower shore. It's, it's one of the periwinkles, but this one, as you might see, uh, doesn't go up to a point. Uh, it's called a flat periwinkle. It might not surprise you to, if I tell you that it mimics gas bladders on um, brown seaweed. You might think it's slightly suicidal if you're going to live on a brown background to be bright yellow. Um, but there's a there's a quite nice little story which might be true. And that is that the bright yellow ones tend to live on the serrated rack. And I know I've just shown you a picture of that. and It looks brown, but serrated rack spends a lot of its time underwater floating. And if you sort of hang upside down in the water and look up through a canopy of um, serrated rack towards the sunlight, you will notice it looks bright yellow. So being bright yellow on serrated rack isn't quite as maladaptive as you, as you might think it would be. And um, flat periwinkles are one of the only things that actually eat the big seaweed. It's a little bit like rabbits eating trees. They can't do it. Um, I'll come on to more of this later, but um, flat periwinkles do actually eat the big brown seaweed. So they've got a food source which very few other things can exploit. And keeled tube worms, these little white uh, squiggly things, looks like um, somebody had been squirting toothpaste or, <coughs> excuse me, all over the rocks. They can't live high up the shore because that tube is porous. It, it houses a little um, segmented worm. And it is worth bearing in mind that um, when they're out of water, they're all locked up trying to keep moisture in. Uh, when they're underwater, they're a little bit more exciting. The uh, feeding apparatus comes out at the end of the tube and starts suspension feeding from, from the water. So that is a, a very, very hurried um, jaunt down the shore from the splash zone to the lower shore. And in a nutshell, the top of the shore is a nightmare, abiotically or physically and chemically, if you like, for marine creatures, hardly any time under seawater. Um, but the big advantage is there isn't much other stuff up there to compete with you or to eat you. As you move down the shore, 
abiotically, physically, chemically, it gets nicer for marine organisms. But the price you pay for that, what I call the lower shore Beverly Hills, is that everybody wants to live there. So there's an intense competition for space. And of course, there are lots of predators. If you've got lots of animals, because there's lots of food, you'll have lots of fish and crabs and what have you trying to eat you. So there's these two counter currents, if you like, of different sets of stresses that rocky shore organisms have got to put up with. And that brings us on to an idea of vertical range. That little black stuff is a lichen, the China pygmaea. It does actually live on exposed shores, but you can see it doesn't occupy a very broad zone. Uh, it has what's called a narrow vertical range, whereas limpets, green seaweeds, for example, have a much broader vertical range. And things with a narrow vertical range tend to be the specialists. They're very, very good at what they do, but they're not very adaptable. Whereas things with a broad vertical range are the generalists. They can live all over the shore, um, but perhaps they're not quite as good at exploiting a particular set of circumstances as, as some of their competitors. And this is a shore that I, I get to work on every year, <laughs> except 2020, of course. It's on Skomer Island. It's called the Wick. Um, to the right of the picture is one of the huge bird colonies. And it's a real privilege to go on this because we're the only people that are allowed to. We do a, a shore survey. And if you have a look on that left hand slope, right at the top of it, you can see some white muck, which is a mixture of minerals and bird poo. Then you come down a bit, you hit a band of brown stuff. And then as you come further down the shore, you go on to grey stuff. And then there's some different stuff at the bottom, which is irrelevant. So within a vertical range, what you tend to find is that if you go up the shore enough, an organism peters out to nothing. So we're talking about this upper brown band. And if you come down the shore enough, that organism's abundance goes to nothing. So a vertical range tends to look a little bit like that, where the upper limit, top of the shores to the right of the diagram, bottom of the shores to the left of the diagram. And just as a, a little summary of what we're saying so far, is that the upper limit of where a rocky shore organism can live is often set by physical and chemical things, water loss, etc temperature, stress, salinity variation, whereas the lower limit of where something can live is often uh, set by other organisms. So competition for space with other organisms or being eaten by something, predation. The middle of the organism's vertical range, the peak of that curve there, that's where there's a problem of a different kind. It's competition, but this time it's within your own species where all of the limpets, for example, are competing for a similar set or identical set of resources. So it's, it's a little way of summarising, if you like, why things live where they do on the shore. Now, the picture of the rocky shore I've just shown you is a textbook rocky shore, and there are very, very few of them. 45 degree slope and nothing awkward like rock pools and crevices to get in the way and upset the distribution patterns. Now, rock pools upset distribution patterns big time because they're providing wet bits further up the rocks. Um, so they allow things that perhaps would be associated with the lower shore to spread up the shore because there's water. But one of the big problems with rock pools is that they vary a lot in temperature, salinity, if it rains or evaporation causes the salinity to go up if um, it's under strong sunlight as the water evaporates. And for green seaweeds, for example, it's like living in a, a McDonald's, if you like. Um, snails can pop in 24 hours a day, have a chomp on some seaweed, have a quick rehydrate. So the seaweeds in rock pools get absolutely hammered. And one way round this, if you see in this picture, the rock is red, as soon as you go underwater, can you see the bottom of the pool is now like concrete, it's gray. That is actually a seaweed, an encrusting species of seaweed, and that incorporates calcium and magnesium into its cell walls, which makes it like rock. It, it's virtually inedible. There are a couple of things that can eat it, and if I've got time at the end, I might go into that a bit. But um, yeah, one of the ways of surviving in a rock pool if you're a seaweed is to make yourself inedible.
And there are rock pool specialists. This is a lovely anemone called a snake locks anemone. And this green one has um, zoanthelae in its tentacles. So it's got an algal um, individuals living inside its tentacles. They photosynthesize, give the anemone the benefits of sugars from photosynthesis. And the anemone gives them a safe place to live. Um, interestingly, they've discovered that um, snake locks with uh, zoanthelae inside them tend to live longer. Nobody's quite sure why. Perhaps they don't have to stress so much to get food. And here's a lovely one I found on a, a shore survey recently. Absolutely beautiful colours. And if you have a look middle right hand side of picture, you can see there's one rather lonely little individual without any algae in its tentacles. So that's what they look like if they haven't got the symbiotic algae. But they're really beautiful anemones. Uh, now I worry about these guys. These are called springtails. You might have noticed I haven't said an awful lot about insects so far and it's actually one of the reasons why I like rocky shores so much is that there aren't that many insects. Uh, but these little guys are springtails, columbolans, I suppose being pedantic it's debatable whether they are insects or not, but they have spiracles so they need air to respire. Uh, spiracles are holes in the side of the body where air goes in into a network of channels